In May 1968, the USS Scorpion sank on its way back to port after a tour of the North Atlantic. Submarines, uh, they communicate roughly once a day. So people weren't quite sure where the sub had sank, but they narrowed it down to a circle 20 miles across and uh, several thousand feet down. Now on the face of it, this seems like an impossible problem because this is a terrifically large volume of water. So how would they hope to find the sub? Now one way they could try and find the sub, and this is maybe the conventional way, they could hire a team of experts, people who knew about submarines, who knew about ocean currents, and have them collaborate. They try and they work together, they pool their expertise, and they try and figure out, okay, where did the submarine come to rest on the ocean floor? But that's not actually the way they did it. They went for something a little more unconventional. Instead, they hired a team of experts, but they had them work separately. So they had mathematicians, they had salvage men, they had submarine experts, and they had each of these experts independently try and figure out where did the submarine sink. And to add some spice to the game, they said the person who gets the closest gets a bottle of brandy. So now what was interesting was when they actually pooled all of the estimates of these experts together, the aggregated estimate was within about 200 feet of where the scorpion actually came to rest on the ocean floor. And what's interesting about that is that that is much closer than any of the individual estimates. So it's like the group as a whole knew something that, uh, knew something that its individual components did not know. So that gives rise to this idea of the wisdom of the crowd. If you have independent estimates and some way of aggregating those estimates, then you can produce very accurate forecasts. Okay, now fast forward to the present day, and uh, suppose I'm terribly ignorant. I don't know who the President of the United States is. So how do I find that piece of information? Okay, I go on Google, I type in President of the United States, and Google says, Barack Obama, okay, you should know that. Suppose I ask a slightly different question. I say, who will be president in 2016? Now, this is a, this is a little more tricky, right? Because uh, well, that presidential election hasn't happened yet, so Google, now Google does return a bunch of results. Uh, it's Hillary Clinton running, some opinion pieces, but this isn't necessarily that easy to sort through, especially if you are so ignorant you didn't know who the president was in the first place. Now, this is really what you would want, right? You would want a, search, a sort of a search engine where you could type in who will be president in 2016, and it would give you a breakdown. It would tell you who's running and our aggregate best estimates of who's going to win. And this is, this is sort of the service that we think of Augur providing, accurate forecasts to the general public. And the way in which we do this is by building prediction markets. There's a lot of pieces to a prediction market, but basically, well, it's a market where you can buy and sell predictions. It's like a stock market is a market where you can buy and sell stock. And the important thing about a prediction market, what gives it forecasting ability, is it turns out that the price of an event so in this case, let's say the event is 42 cents, 42 cents per share. This means that there is a 42% chance of the event happening, assuming there's sufficient liquidity and uh, some other constraints on the market. Now, this is pretty complicated. This is how, this is how our system is actually set up. Um, now, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but what I do want to point out is um, that a prediction market is broken up into three basic pieces. So you have the, you know, some event that you're interested in, maybe a presidential election. There's all the stuff that happens before the event, the event itself, and everything after the event. Now, all the stuff that happens before the event, this is where betting and forecasting takes place. So this is where you're trying to make predictions. You're trying to guess what the answer is. You are trying to put your money where your mouth is. You're betting in cash. And then the event happens, and then we have to try and figure out what actually happened. People reporting on the event after it has happened. So after the presidential election, very easy to figure it out, as we discovered with Google. There's been a few prediction markets before. Uh, a couple of them are in trade in the policy analysis market. The problem with them is they're centralized, so they're easy to shut down. Uh, they can go bankrupt. They can run away with your funds. And more importantly, they can lie about the outcomes of events. So this is an example from Intrade. Uh, the 2012 Iowa caucus was very close. Intrade reported that Rick Santorum won. And two weeks later, they announced that he actually didn't win. Anyone who bet on Romney lost their money. Intrade didn't go back on their payouts, and so these people basically lost their money, and they shouldn't, shouldn't have. And with the decentralized system, what would happen instead is people would say, well, we don't know the answer yet. Let's push it back and report on it at a later time. And so now we're going to walk through some of the types of prediction markets. So as Jack described, there's basic binary prediction markets. You ask, will this event happen, yes or no? He mentioned presidential election. That's one here. You can also ask more complicated things. You can ask about, say, the price of the S&P 500. 
in a certain time period. And you can basically wager whether it will be lower or higher. You can long or short it. You can also ask more complicated questions. And these are called, the ones in the bottom are called categorical. And so basically, you ask a bunch of questions, and they're all mutually exclusive. And there's generally one option that's like none of the above. So that way, you cover all possibilities. The really cool types are multi, multi-dimensional markets. So you can have a market that, for instance, when they were trying to pass the stimulus plan, it would have been really cool if we could have had a prediction market that said, if the stimulus plan is passed, what will the effect be on, say, the GDP? So you could have the GDP, you know, will it be above this percent, yes or no, on one side. On the other side, you could have whether the bill is passed or not. And the current share prices are what the market thinks is likely to happen. So you could determine, will passing the stimulus actually increase GDP, or will it likely have no effect? You can even get more complicated by basically taking these scalar ones, as we talked about with the S&P, and pairing them with a binary outcome. So you could say you know, whether a bill will have an effect on some metric. In this example, it's Obamacare and female life expectancy. You can do the same thing by having more than one scalar outcome. And the coolest type of prediction market is called multidimensional categorical. So basically, if you want to know what the best strategy is for your company, for instance, you could try to make the decisions one at a time. So you could say, we should use R&D to do this, or should we use it for that? Or you could say, you know, should we replace our CEO with somebody else, yes or no, and decide on it at that time? However, what's a lot cooler is if you basically say, what's the best combinations, combinations of these decisions? Because that may be different than what they would be if you decided them individually. You can see what the market thinks. Now we're going to go through our prototype, a kind of a high-level overview, so you can get like, more of a feel of what this actually looks like. So. Basically, you would have you know, an account at the top left, just like you have with Bitcoin. You'd have some type of cash. You could create a new branch. A branch is basically a subject category. So you could create a science branch, a politics branch. You can also propose your own questions. So in a traditional prediction market, for instance, like Intrade, Intrade decides the questions that are asked. With our markets, anybody can ask a question. So if you want to know about cold fusion, you can propose the question. And you can provide initial liquidity to the market, and you can wager on that. And then here's an example of buying shares. This person bought 4,000 shares of false, thinking it's not going to happen. And then you have reporting. So after the events occurred, people basically report, yes, it happened, no, it didn't happen, or I don't have an idea if it happened or not. And so now we're going to get into how our system actually works, because that's all high level, but what's actually going on under the hood. So in a traditional prediction market, you have order books. So we each say, you know, I'll buy I'll buy this many shares for this price, and you say, oh, well, I'll sell them at this price, we meet in the middle. With our market, we use a thing called the automated market maker. So instead of buying shares with an order book, you buy them from an equation. So there's mainly six things that you want in an automated market maker. You want bounded loss, which means whoever provides liquidity to the market can't lose an infinite amount of money. Um, you also want a bid-ask spread that approaches zero. So with Intrade, when they had order books, Someone could have wanted to buy shares for, say, 20 cents, and someone wanted to sell them for 40, and those are the only two orders. And so that's a pretty terrible estimate of the odds of something happening. So if the difference between what people are willing to buy and sell prices for approaches zero, you can actually get a good odds estimate of the likelihood of an event happening. Additionally, you want unlimited market depth. So if I'm a whale and I have a million dollars, and I want to buy a lot of shares in the market, I should be able to even if it's going to cost me a lot per share, I should still be able to buy that many shares. Additionally, you want no money pump opportunities. So basically, since we're using an equation, some very bad market scoring rules have this thing where if you buy and sell shares in a certain combination, you can, you can actually steal the liquidity from the market and basically get you know, essentially a free lunch. So almost no good ones have that. The two features that almost <coughs> the very few market scoring rules have the hardest ones to get are the ones on the bottom. So you have liquidity increasing with volume. So traditionally, in a regular market scoring rule, if there's 100 shares on outcome yes and 100 shares on no, and I buy 10 shares of yes, the price may increase like 80 or 90 cents a share, which is insane. Because in a traditional parimutuel market, like say horse racing, the odds wouldn't change that much. So what you want is instead, if it's 100 and 100 and I buy 10 shares, you want the price to increase by, say, maybe 2 or 3% or 2 or 3 cents. And additionally, you want the person to be able to make a profit. So whoever's providing liquidity to these markets, you don't want them to just lose their money. Otherwise, there's not very much incentive for them to make a market. 
So now we're going to get into the actual scoring rules. So the, the part that says C of Q, C is basically the cost. So how much you're going to pay. And so Q is called the share vector. Basically, you have a list of how many shares there are of each outcome. So let's say we're talking about a binary out market. There's yes or no. So there's you know, 10 shares of yes, 5 of no. That's Q. And so we'll go over LMSR first. The problem with LMSR is it has the volume issue. Oh, sorry, it's logarithmic market scoring rule. And so the problem with LMSR is if we have 100 shares, 100 shares, I buy 10, the price goes up to 90 cents, which is terrible. Anyway, though, you choose a number called B. Nobody really knows how to choose it. That's the problem with LMSR. It's very hard to pick a proper B. And essentially, what you do is you take how many shares of each outcome you start off with. So let's say initially the market has zero shares in each outcome. And I want to buy five shares of no. So first, I calculate the cost with zero and zero. I just basically put zero in for Q1, zero in for Q2. In that equation, I get some, some answer. The cost is going to be zero, because it's zero. And then if I buy five shares, I put five shares of Q1, zero for Q2. And I'll get some cost that's around probably like three or four, three or four dollars. Now, with LLS LMSR, this solves the problems of liquidity. So basically, as more and more shares are bought, it modifies the liquidity function. And this allows you to basically solve that problem we talked about earlier with the 100 and 100. And if you buy, if you basically buy a small amount of shares and it's even odds, the odds should stay almost even. And the final type of market maker is the VPM. So sorry, LS and the LS stands for liquidity sensitive. VPM is volume parameterized market maker. It's basically just a modification to the LS LMSR. It's Microsoft's version because they have a version of everything. It's it's really it's really not much better than it's slightly better than LMSR, not as good as LS LMSR. So right now we're thinking of using LS LMSR. There is a final market maker, and that's called AMSR. Um, it's actually called this really long sentence, like profit charging market makers with bounded loss and unlimited order depth. But it's a terrible name. So the guy who created it is called Abe, so we just call it AMSR. And I don't have the equations for it on here because there's like four or five, and it's insanely complicated. So we cover the buying and selling shares. The other part that basically needs to be decentralized is the reporting. So with Ntrade, Ntrade tells you what happened, and that's that. There's no punishment if Ntrade lies besides maybe losing a few customers, um, but they really didn't lose that many. In fact, they, their customers increased. So with our system, what happens instead is we hopefully will have thousands of people reporting on the outcomes of events. These people have a sort of reputation, not in the traditional sense of reputation. And if you basically go against the consensus, you'll lose reputation. If you go with it, you'll gain reputation from people who didn't report. So if someone's lazy and they don't report on the outcome of an event, they'll lose some reputation. So half the trading fees go to these people. They're divvied, among, divvied up amongst them. The other half go to the person who provides the liquidity. And so for reputation, one common problem is if you have you know, a set of people, let's say there's 1,000 of them who are reporting, and then this becomes really popular, and there's, say, like 10,000 markets, 10,000 events, you don't want people to have to you know, hit yes or no on 10,000 separate events because they're never going to do it the system would probably just fail then and there. So what we do is we say, well, we'll have branches. Branches are basically categories. So initially, the reputation will just be all in one pool because it will start out pretty small. There won't be very many people using it. And then as it grows, you can make your own categories. So you can make a science category, and that have its own reputation. And if the science one gets really popular, you can make you know, like computer science. And you could even make like a cryptography subject if it gets popular enough. So like Joey was saying, we want to decentralize all aspects of this. Uh, and, and this includes the, the reporting on events after they've already happened. So if you're running a website like Intrade, it's very easy to, to report on what actually happened after, say, a presidential election. You look it up, and you have the final say. And that's it. And, and, and Joey talked about the problems with that. Uh, now, we want to decentralize that part as well. Uh, so, and that means getting information about the world uh, into the blockchain, right? Blockchains are by default ignorant about the state of the world. And so we do sort of the most 
obvious thing. We just ask people what actually happened. Um, and specifically, we do that uh, by having them vote on many events together. So uh, what I'm showing you here is across the top, these are the actual event out. These are actual event outcomes. So this is for uh, a, a simulation. So the uh, events that have an outcome of uh, negative one resolve to false. Uh, one resolves to true and zero is indeterminate. Basically meaning that the person asked a bad question and therefore should lose all their fees. Um, so these are, the, these are the actual correct answers across the top. So this is sort of a test case. And what it, this giant grid of numbers is, is we gather all the votes of everybody who has reputation tokens in our system. And the way this works is if you have one reputation token, then you have one vote. And if Joey has five reputation tokens, then his vote essentially counts five times. Um, so it's not one person, one vote. It's like one reputation token, one vote. And everyone that has one of these tokens can place a vote. And uh, these are recorded in a matrix. And here every row represents a voter, someone casting, someone casting a report on what has happened uh, for an event that's already, that's already occurred. And, and each column represents uh, a different event. Um, so you don't vote on uh, only one event in isolation. You're given, a, you're given a whole ballot to vote on. So it might be, you know, the, will Hillary Clinton be elected in 2016? And will GDP go up in 2016? You might, you'll have a whole list from here. In this uh, simulated example, you have uh, 25 events. They're all gathered into the same ballot, and you have 50 voters. Um, now, so it's a little hard to sort of grasp what's going on in this giant grid of numbers. But the way I set this up is that some people in this grid are telling the truth, meaning that their answers correspond to the correct answers. Other people are lying. And the liars can copy each other, right? So sort of forming little conspiracies. And what we want to do with this is, if you, if you look at this, you can see, well, there's, there's some amount of variability in this, in this matrix, in this big grid of numbers. And what, what we want to do is make use of the insight that lies are more variable than truths. And so what we want to do is find which voter is sort of the weirdest voter? Who's contributing most to the overall variability in the system? And we want to punish him the most, because that means that he's very likely not reporting honestly. Right? Everybody who's just trying to report honestly, just trying to report what actually happened, they should all say the same thing. Right? If you ask everybody in this room who's the President of the United States, we shouldn't get 10 different answers. Right? This is stuff that's already happened, and you're just reporting on stuff that's already happened. And the way we do this is with a mathematical technique, uh, a common mathematical technique called principal component analysis. So I'm not going to go into the details of how this works, although I'm happy to talk about it if anybody wants to ask me. Um, but basically what we do is we find each, each voter's contribution to the overall variability in the system. Um, and that's what's expressed, uh, that's what's expressed uh, here on the x-axis. Um, and the, uh, the, the y-axis is how much reputation they gained or lost that round. So what we'd like to see is as their, their contribution to the overall variability in the system goes up, uh, the, they should be punished more. Right? They should lose more reputation tokens. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's, you can see that's actually what, uh, that, that's actually the trend that's observed here. Um, and the, the circles represent the number of people that voted in a particular way. So this, the, the blue circle is people that told the truth. And they were rewarded uh, by the system. And the, the red circles represent people that were lying, but they weren't perfectly coordinated. So they're sort of overwhelmed by the people that told the truth. Um, what is everybody losing reputation? Not everybody is. Okay. Uh, all, everybody that lied is, which is, actually the, which is actually the answer that you want. Okay. 
Because it's, it, 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 so all of the, the red crosses, the red circles, these represent people who weren't telling the truth. And this is just, well, this is a test case. Uh, and, I, and I happen to know this because I know what the right answer is. Okay, so so the, these blue, are the blue circle is a large set of people who all came to agreement, and the red, they're all individual, like, aberrant. That's right. Okay. And so the blue people, they, they were just, they looked up who's the president of the United States, and of course they all said the same thing. Yeah. And they all gained some amount of reputation. And at the expense of people who weren't telling the truth. After every round of voting, uh, reputation gets redistributed using this mechanism. Uh, so, so now we're going to go over some of the design decisions we made. So there's a few things you can do. One, you can just build this from scratch, um, ignore everything that's ever been done, and just start from the bottom. But we decided this is a bad idea because, well, Netscape tried it in the 90s. It didn't work very well. And it, it generally would just take a really long time. Another option is to fork Bitcoin and basically modify that and do a Bitcoin sidechain. Uh, what kind of turned us off of, from that is we basically did this project called SagCoin. It allowed you to add up all the unspent transactions in Bitcoin and bootstrap a new blockchain using those. And it took a really long time, even though we were doing like this really simple thing. If you change like a couple things in Bitcoin's code, six or seven other things break, and you have to fix those. And it's it's almost it almost wasn't worth it. Um, another option is build colored coins. Uh, the problem with colored coins is a person has to basically create them, which has a pretty huge element of centralization. So what we decided instead was to use Ethereum. Originally, we didn't want to use Ethereum because they basically you couldn't, you couldn't use sidechain Bitcoin on it. Um, but instead, they're going to add that. And so the reason we chose Ethereum were it's we don't have to deal with the security for most of it anyway. We have to deal with the security of our reporters. But the low level stuff, we don't have to touch. Um, it's much faster to iterate through. It's much simpler to just write a contract in Serpent. Serpent's a programming language that Ethereum has. It's kind of similar to Python, but with less features. And basically, <laughs> basically, you take Serpent, and it compiles into EVM, which is Ethereum Virtual Machine Code. And there's also another, another Ethereum language called, Serpent, or called, uh, called Solidity. And it also does the same thing. It compiles into Virtual Machine Code. The reason we didn't choose Solidity was because when we started this, Solidity didn't really exist. Another question we get a lot is, why not use Counterparty? They support Serpent. Um, so I talked to the, I think his name's Adam Krallenstein or something like that. He says they don't plan to support sidechains, which is fine, because we could basically issue a stable coin from within the contract. The problem is, you also can't do that. Um, another solution would be to just use their like, pseudo Bitcoin that they have, but they removed that because they were worried about regulation. <clears throat> so basically, every possible route that we could have used Counterparty, they either don't, don't intend to support or don't support anymore. And so I guess I'll give a little high-level overview of our contract, what our contract's actually doing. So there's basically functions in our contracts. You can call them, and they basically modify certain things. So you can send, send cash or reputation to other addresses. You can make a new branch, basically a new subject. You can make a new event. You can make markets, which are basically combinations of events. So if you want to do some fancy combinatorial thing, you make a market. And the person who makes the market has to provide some initial liquidity. Um, there's buy and sell functions. And there's the reporting function. And then there's the resolving function, which basically takes all the shares that people have in a market and divvies up the, the reward afterwards. So the reward in a prediction market is a dollar per share. So however many shares you have, convert it to dollars, and that's how much reward you get. The problem with that is you can't really use dollars on a blockchain. Um, so first we planned to basically sidechain Bitcoin, and then we thought about it a bit more and, and realized you could just use a stable coin. And so basically what you would do is you'd have a decentralized exchange, you'd exchange Bitcoin for this stable coin, and it maintains its value with respect to something, probably the US dollar. There's a few routes to do stable coin. Uh, one is contract for difference. Basically, the way this works is you have two parties. One of them takes essentially double the volatility of Bitcoin. The other person basically just gets a standard amount in dollars back. And you basically do this over a period of time. Another route is Hayek money. Um, there's, there's actually a ton of implementations of stablecoin. These are the two I like best. Um, and Hayek money is kind of weird because <clears throat> so 
basically you could have 100, 100 units of something in your wallet one day, and the next you could have 150. Basically all it does is it looks at the current exchange rate, which is very easy to do decentralized in our system since we have these reporters, and it looks at the exchange rate and says, should we basically print more units of money and distribute them to everyone, or take away units of money? The cool thing about Hayek money is it's basically a central bank, except the central bank isn't taking the money away from you and giving it to the government. It's basically divvying it up amongst the people. Another question is, what about people like, so basically when you're reporting, you may have like, you know, a lot of things to report on. If the system gets popular, you may have like say 200 things in your ballot. So a lot of people say, well, why not just use reality keys? Well, it's kind of centralized. They just issue the key that, that they say, so you have the same in-trade problem. Instead, what we plan to do is basically make APIs. So if you're you know, doing things like elections, which have an outcome you can easily pull from an API, you can basically have it so your computer will automatically report according to that API. So a lot of people say, well, why not just have this built in? We want to build it around our system because if it's built in, we're basically forcing central centralization on people. Instead, what we believe is you should start out as decentralized as possible, and if you want to, it's up to each individual reporter. They could add elements of centralization in by basically plugging into an API. Um, a couple other things about our system are there are applications besides just prediction markets. One is basically peer-to-peer -peer wagers. You can use the outcome of a prediction market to basically wager on things with your buddies. Um, and then the other one is you can pay for basically a decentralized oracle. So if you have any question that you want an oracle to report on, you can pay a fee to our network and you can get an answer that is basically not from a centralized party, which is very useful. Yeah, so the question is, how does the reputation start? Where does it come from? Um, we plan to crowd sell the reputation. Basically, we think an auction is the best way to do it because people will be incentivized to actually use it. Have you, have you thought through the usability aspect of it? Is it going to be client where you download or is it going to be all web-based? How do you and then keep it peer to peer and decentralized so eliminating usability? So in, initially, it, everything is going to just be peer to peer decentralized. Um, but uh, you know, it, as this becomes hopefully more popular, uh, we imagine that people will build web-based interfaces, much the way that there are web wallets for Bitcoin now. Ideally, the like the ideal interface would be: you go to a website and it has a magnet link on it. You click on the link, and it basically downloads our uh, our JavaScript code, and it runs it locally. And you can connect to peers, so you don't have this centralization problem that you do with web wallets but you also have this beautiful user experience. So maybe I was mistaken, but this doesn't seem like it's a really hyperdimensional space you're working in. So how are you using PCA and how is it affected that? Um. So it, the, the, dimen the dimensionality of the space that we're working in is actually the number of events. Um, and we're not using PCA for its, the way it's normally used, uh, which is the way you're probably familiar with it, dimensionality that. reduction. But what we're, doing, we're using is, uh, so we find the, the covariance matrix of uh, the ballot. And um, that's the thing that we diagonalize. That's the thing that goes into the machinery of uh, PCA. And the, the first principal component, it's pointing in the direction of maximum variability, maximum variance, right? And so we take the original, well, centered data and project it onto that component. And that tells you how much did each person contribute to that direction. Cool. So those are your wires. That's right. And so the people, if you have a higher score, like if, if your projection onto the first component is, is very high, then you're sort of the weirdest guy. And you're, uh, you're, you're lying, or you're, you're very likely to be lying because you're contributing the most to the variability of the system. What kind of scores on each component are you getting before you cut it off? Um, so in the example I showed, it was about, uh, so the, the, the percent of variance explained was 45%, something like that. And um, we actually expected that uh, performance would be better by, uh, if we say set a fixed threshold, and then did like a, 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 a weighted sum, you know, with the, the eigenvectors, weight them with their eigenvalues, up to some threshold, make it the same every time. 
But it, it seems like empirically, when, at least when we're running simulations, uh, we actually get more reliable results just by taking the first principal component every time. Which is fine, it's, it's you know, computationally easier, so. I have a question about uh, counterparty modulation. You used it here. Uh, are, are you guys a counterparty of that? Meaning, like, if I, if, if, if I want to make a bet on the weather in Denver on June 9th, right? Um, I, I make an offer price, and is that, that bet only comes into existence when things get decided, or are you guys going to decide? Neither of those, actually. So what, what happens is the, uh, the person who creates the market supplies uh, a certain amount of uh, initial liquidity. The exact way that happens is a little different for those, the, the three equations. But um, uh, basically, you're now betting against this pool of money that's in the market. Uh, but you're actually buying and selling shares from a, a market maker equation, if that makes sense. But then as, as more people come in, uh, liquidity slash volume increases. And you will, you know, eventually pretty much be buying from other people if other, other real people actually take the side, the other side. So, for instance, let's say there's a market maker and he provides like $20 of initial liquidity. You could put in $500 into the market, but the price you're going to be paying for share, per share is going to be very high. So you may be paying like up to like 90, 98, 99 cents a share, which means your available profit's pretty small. So who would be the other side of that trade? So then in, in that case, the other side would be hopefully somebody else comes in, like an actual person, and buys up the other side. So then you can buy your shares for a more reasonable price. But does the trade clear before somebody else comes in? In which case, you guys are on the bus? Or? Whoever makes the market. So the thing about our system is anybody can make a market. Um, so whoever makes that market and provides the initial liquidity is basically, quote unquote, on the hook. Um, the maximum amount of money they can lose is determined by these equations. Yeah, basically, the, the, the counterparty is anybody who's holding shares in the market already. Question about the, uh, the sort of reputation tokens. You said they're going to be sort of, sort of an auction intentionally, and then they're sort of expansionary, right? Because you said each, after each sort of decision is reached, reputation tends to expand as long as everyone agrees. Oh, no, no. Uh, so reputation is actually uh, zero sum. So we're going to, uh, when we do uh, the uh, crowd sell for reputation, that will be all the reputation tokens. Is, are they then sort of fungible and transferable to other users, or...? Uh, yeah, so you can, you can send them to other users, but the, the total amount of reputation is fixed. Um, and, and so, the, w when I showed you that graph where people were gaining and losing reputation, they're actually just gaining and losing from each other. In a, so there's a fixed supply, but then, is it, if it's sort of tradable, I can buy a lot of reputation, right? There'll be a price per reputation, that's like a... Yeah, that's right. Uh, so you can never really have predictions that exceed the value of, say, buying up more than half of the reputation. That's correct. That's going to be a limit. Okay. If, uh, as a, you know, I understand this is the question, and then I become the market maker who provides liquidity for the bed. What is the incentive? To, you know, say those the limits a lot, or even not. What is the incentive to for me to do that? What am I getting at? It? it is a zero sum game. <laughs> so there's two things. The, the, zero, the zero sum game is actually the reputation, which is what happens after the fact. For you, it's not a zero sum game. Um, so you're the market maker. What happens is if you provide liquidity, you get half of the fees that are traded in that market. And what the market maker can do is he can set his own trading fee. Um, it's basically a fancy variable on one of these equations. You can pick it. If you pick it too high, people probably won't use your market. Somebody else will just make a cheaper one. But you get half of those trading fees. The other half go to the reputation holders. In the scenario where, say, you have 50 voters and maybe 26 of them have decided to delegate to some public API, uh, and then somebody else subverts that public API, so they give the majority of that opinion. After that happens, the system needs manual restart. I mean, that bet, was, that bet went wrong. Everybody sees that it went wrong. People collected their names. The people who lied gained reputation because they were in the majority. And at that point, Restart. So I'll, I'll let Jack answer the second half of this, but for the first part, so if you did that, it wouldn't actually work because so that would, it's really easy to cheat a system if you, if you vote on one thing at a time. But we have the ballot. So you basically have to get those people to plug into APIs for each event on the ballot. Um, the other thing is we're planning on doing is randomizing what you vote on. So there's no way to know ahead of time what exactly is going to be on your ballot. 
I'll let Jack answer any more technical uh, PCA stuff he wants to. And let's see, what was, uh, so the, se the second part, I guess, would be like, uh, if uh, you, can, you can challenge uh, votes that are uh, placed automatically via API uh, after the fact. So you can, you can essentially call a vote. Uh, even if there's, uh, it's it's a you know a recurring market with results coming in automatically. <laughs> um, well, so you can you can call uh, so you can call sort of a, a revote on everybody who is voting automatically via API. So they don't necessarily vote automatically. They've done that so that they don't miss votes. They're like, uh, I I want to put something. Yeah, there is there is an auditing system, which I think is what you'd actually want to use in this case. Um, the auditing system, it was originally planned if there were like miners, they would audit it, but there's no miners in our system besides the Ethereum ones. Um, so basically, you would have some sort of audit system with using... Um, so, so the way an audit would work is if you fail to reach some threshold that's higher than 50%, um, by default it might be 60 or 75%, uh, then that triggers an audit. And what an audit does is it brings in a different, it, at first it delays the vote, and then it brings in a different pool of people. So initially it's reputation holders, right? So these are the same people over and over again that could conceivably be bribed or something. Or maybe they're just sort of attached to an API that's gone horribly wrong. Um, now the the backup pool of voters. Let's say it got a majority. Yeah. So say it got a majority. So somebody manually says, "Now we're going to go audit on this one," or every single one goes to the second system. Well, so the first one goes to the second system. Um. When you say every single one, I mean this looks exactly the same to the system, to the software, as a successful resolution. Oh, so you mean does every does every event in the matrix go to? Yes. There was a majority that said something, and then people afterwards say that looks wrong. And meanwhile, people are trying to collect their, their wings. Right. So the, this the so it does apply to uh, all the events in the matrix, and uh, the, this backup group of people is everybody who was participating in the market, like in the forecasting half of the market. Um, so this is a different group of people with uh, presumably different incentives, and they're not going to be automatically staked to any API. Um, so these will all be people voting manually. But what triggers that? Is that triggered on every single decision? Um, so, so this is something we can talk about. But like the, if we implemented uh, this audit system that we've been thinking about, it would be that this would be automatically triggered if you fail to reach some threshold that's higher than uh, 50 percent. Uh, the number we had talked about was 60 or maybe 70 percent. If that one's better, why not use it for the first place? I'm sorry. If that was more reliable, you wouldn't use it the first choice. Well, not that it, it's not that it's more reliable; it's that it's different. So it's like it's it's an independent opinion. It's an, it's an independent opinion that is not permitted to attach itself to an API, right? So now you could still subvert those people individually, but you wouldn't have this sort of pseudo centralization problem where you've got an API, lots of people just grabbing results from it. Um, and alternative would be just to have anybody that's anybody that's actually voting. Uh, in the system and says, hey, there's something funny going on with this API, they can, uh, they can, call, a, um, they can call a manual revote for uh, uh, everybody in, uh, that's holding reputation tokens, even the ones that were uh, attached to an API. And I, know, and I get that that's inconvenient because these people are just like, oh, I just wanted to make a bunch of free money. But that's, that, well, that's part of why reputation holders get fees. So, so it's easier to subvert the second system. Anybody can say to the first vote, I'd rather the second system decide. Well, I think the second system would, would be more robust in that case because it is just people voting manually. It's slower. It's, slower. it's less convenient. Uh, and our thinking is for there's an awful lot of events where the API is going to be right. You know, like if your if your event is something like about have to do with the weather, like weather.com is not going to lie to you. They have and maybe there's there might be some weird instance where they get they get hacked and the hackers decide that you know the best thing they can think of is just to feed incorrect results and and that's why the, the manual vote would be there as a backup. What's the um the main incentive for people to vote in the balance? I'm sorry. What's the main incentive for people to vote in the in the balance? Oh um the the. The main incentive is just that uh, if you don't vote at all, uh, that
that's, that's automatically an incorrect vote. No vote is automatically wrong. Okay, so you lose reputation over time. Right. Okay. And the reputation, like, do you think you have any issues with the feds? Like, is there some game? Do you think you have issues with that maybe becoming just like a speculative asset, like a lot of kind of altcoins and stuff? Have now where people just start randomly buying and selling that. So I, I think I don't think that would happen because it, it may become more speculative, but. The, the lowest bound it would have is whatever value is half the trading fees in, in the markets on our system. So if, if you know if there's $10 million in trading fees a year in our system, um, the market capitalization or reputation would be at the minimum 10 million. If people thought our system was gonna last longer, it may be worth more, but and that, that's also part of the main incentive to report is you do get whatever portion of reputation you own multiplied by 0.5 of the trading fees. Point zero five, I guess. Zero zero five. Yeah, a lot of people have asked the same question with the same fee. We're trying to bond together in terms of who do you report or search that function results. Um, so it wouldn't automatically combine. Um, the UI will have a search feature though, so you'll be able to search, you know, for questions that have already been asked. And we could also add a add a thing in the UI where if you propose a question and it's already been asked, it could pop up and be like, Hey, someone asked a question similar to yours, are you sure you want to re ask it? Beyond that, anything else I think would be adding too much centralization. And so I'm still wondering about the initial liquidity um, of a specific vote. So it, if, if I wanted to make a new question, do I have to choose a side? And if so, like what would be the, the, the effective price that I have to pay? So it depends on which market maker you use. Um, we'll go with the one that we plan on using which is called uh, LS, LMSR. So for this one, there's two things you have to do. One is you have to choose what trading fee you want. Do you want a 1% you know, trading fee, half a percent, two percent, whatever. The other thing you have to do is you have to start the market off with at least some amount of initial liquidity. It could mean just buying one share of each outcome, which is gonna cost you around a little bit over a dollar. Um, the more liquidity you buy, the more likely people are to use your market because people like liquid markets but you can start out with a small amount if you want to. And you can also pick which side you want to start off with. So if it's something like who will win the presidential election and you think it's going to be Hillary, you can put your money on Hillary initially. But you don't have to. You could just split it up evenly. Isn't that a little bit unfair because of the fact that like, you effectively, if you get to choose which side, that even the first one in that specific market, then you kind of get to have a lot of influence over the initial, essentially the initial exchange rate. And so just by virtue of being the first one in that market, you can potentially make a lot of money. If, if the uh, outcome is something that doesn't have a 50-50 a probability of happening, like if, if there's like a 90% probability that it's gonna go one way, then you can choose that direction and get a, a very favorable exchange rate, right? So it's, it's actually the exact opposite. So, so when you use a market maker, um, the first people who buy are going to pay a really expensive price. So let's say it's something like, um, you know, say, say an election, I guess. It's the easiest example. And you're like 90% sure this candidate's going to win. So, and you being the market maker, you can, you can buy shares first. So if you put, if you buy like 10 shares on say, out, let's say it's outcome one, the price you pay for those 10 shares is going to be very expensive. Um, the, because basically the way, the way the equation works is when there's less liquidity, you pay, the, the more shares you buy, the, the quicker the price increases. It basically prevents the problem you were talking about where basically allowing you to set the odds, which you don't want to happen. Instead what happens is you buy those shares, the price is gonna shoot up to like 95 cents a share for your outcome. Then so on the other side, people are heavily incentivized to buy the other side of the bet. And they're gonna be able to buy it very cheaply since you being the initial market whale push the price up for one side. But see, that's, that's the same problem though, because it's just, it's just offset onto the second person who joins that market. Because like you said, if somebody puts a lot of liquidity on one side initially, then the second person who gets in is gonna get a very cheap share in the opposite direction. So it's, it's like the, the, the reason why regular markets work so well is that you always have a counterparty at, at that exact price level. So the, the, the reason why you, 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 know, you don't have infinite liquidity is because sometimes you can't get somebody who, 
who takes the other side of that bet. But if you just choose, if you just choose a price algorithmically, you're not guaranteed to have an actual counterparty so, at that price. Liquidity sensitive LMSRs are just market makers. You can you can picture them as a depth chart, and they, they start with the subsidy, and the total amount of that subsidy is the total amount of debt. You can't actually bet past the amount that the LMSR has to subsidize. So all it is is a market maker that builds a depth chart. It is bound to loss. And because it's liquidity sensitive, um, part of what you part of what happens when you take the LSR as a counterparty is you're putting a little bit more in its market making mode and you're increasing the depth. So you can imagine you know, you're taking liquidity, um, you're taking 99% of liquidity, but you're adding back in 1% debt. Right? So everybody, everybody's a price taker, but there's still a real depth trend. It's not, it's not kind of but isn't it, it's effectively synthetic though, right? Because you're not actually like matching trade for trade. It doesn't matter. It's a, mathematically it's the same. I guess I'm still confused on that point. I mean, someone has to have this sort of trade. And either it's a counterparty, either it's, you know, I, I trade with you or I trade with the exchange. But you, you kind of dodge the question. And, 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 and so which is it? Is it so you're trading, trading with the market trading market 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 there or trading with you guys? You're trading with the entire existing pool of voters, everybody that has shares in the market already, because that's what's setting the price of the, of the buy that you want to make. Maybe so. explain how the pale works. That may have. So when you, when you, if you buy at 90 cents, you're not getting the same pale as 10 cents. You're, you're betting against, if I understand correctly, the virtual person that is comprised of the total degrees. Yeah, that's, no, that's exactly right. Exactly. That's totally right. Um, and it has infinite liquidity in the sense that if you're willing to pay an extremely high price. And so like initially, if, if the market's been funded, it has to be funded with some initial liquidity. So let's say $10 is put in and you want to buy some shares. The direct person you're buying against is the person who provided that $10 in initial liquidity if nobody else is in the market. Now if Jack comes in and buys five shares and somebody else buys five shares, and then I come and buy share, five shares, as he said, you're basically buying from the sum of us. You're not you're not buying from any individual person since because you're buying from an equation. So there's not really a trade that's not questionable. Right, it's not it's not a traditional trade. You can buy and sell shares, but it's not a trade. So how do you guys do the job of the shares? A and then B in terms of um, you mentioned that the number of users would be effective so yeah, of course, any system is easier to attack when there's few users, just like Bitcoin was in 2009, 2010. Um, that's part of the reason we're doing a crowd sale to basically, you know, start off with as many reputation holders as we can. Um, ideally, the bigger the market is, the harder it is to collude because you have to, you know, basically buy up. Um, 50%. It's it's pretty hard to buy at 50% of an asset um, because as soon as you do, the price of it is going to increase like, almost exponentially. And what was the second question? Right, but in terms of any given market, there are only you see, like three markets at a time buying half the half of reputation to complement that market. It might not be that expensive. So reputation system wide, it's not market specific. And um, so if there are only three markets. That'd be kind of bad. Um, <laughs> that our, our, our system, our system would basically be a failure, and it wouldn't really matter if someone included in that case. Yeah, it's like um, it wouldn't be worth attacking. The the minimum amount of markets you need to do effective um, PCA though is around twenty. Um, it's very hard to like qualify or quantify this, uh, but there's a video on YouTube where they basically do something that's similar to PCA called SVD, uh, Singular Value Decomposition, and they do it with a photo. And if you have like 20 points of information, you can basically compose over 95% of the photo. And so the answer is basically you need at least 20 markets to have anything meaningful. So basically, if you don't have 20 markets, what happens? Um, then I suppose people could collude if they wanted to. Um, it's, it's not really any easier to collude because of the fact that it's, you can't really prove to people how you voted until after the fact. So one attack that you could do is um, you could try to bribe voters. That's a much easier attack than colluding. I, mean, I, think, I think the main issue would just be that, like the, um, the PCA itself would not work as effectively, you know, if there's 
if there's smaller amounts of data. Um, but the, the system might be uh, not as worth attacking then either, because yeah. if there really was just three markets, then uh, you know, or something's gone horribly wrong. The seed, the seed markets aren't going to be huge, and right. so they're not going to be worth attacking, and then by the time, you know, well, but it depends if attacking it requires them to put money in scale. Yeah. Like there are, there are world burners, I definitely agree, but like... But like world burners with a ton of resources and with nothing to lose? Yeah, I mean, I think you should protect yourself against world burners, but, you know, it's just like, okay, if they were to try and burn you guys, like, you know, what's the cost of that? Yeah, I mean, the I, I guess any, any kind of really any crypto uh, currency has this, this issue initially where, well, it's easy to attack in the beginning. Um, but that's also the, the period which we think there will be, you know, people won't perceive it as being worth attacking. Um, Not a lot of people know about it. Right. If it, and if it never reaches enough volume to, like, have more than three markets, it doesn't really matter if people attack it. Like, I won't even care if people attack it then because our system's a failure. And that's, that's actually one of the big reasons that we want to do a crowd sale is because we don't want to have this sort of ramping up period where there might just be three markets and, you know, anybody with $500 can break the entire system. Um, and hopefully the, 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 the crowd sale by getting uh, all the reputation out there at once and uh, getting a lot of people into the system will, will bypass that problem. Last question here. Could the system be built to support where users could choose their own algorithm or put in their own algorithm so that the market can determine which like LSL, LMR would be the best? So it could. Um, we've debated a lot back and forth with this. Some people think you should allow people to you know, choose as many knobs as they want, um, even change the equation. Um, other people say you should have one equation and you should have knobs that are tunable but fairly easy for people to understand. Um, there's a couple of pros and cons to each. So the pro of the simple one is people like simple things, it's easier to use, et cetera. Um, for the tunable side, like the, you can choose whatever you want. It's nice because people who are smarter market makers can choose better equations. The problem with it though is you could choose an equation that basically loses a lot of money. And the problem with that is it's fine if you lose money, but it's not fine if you're basically forcing the reporters to pay to report because the reporters are going to have to like take their time to report. And so if, if they're not getting any trading fees and in fact your market lost money, it's not very good for them. Um, so we're leaning towards the side of basically going with the best market scoring rule, allowing people to tune the knobs on it almost as much as they want, but not allowing different market scoring rules. Mostly because the other ones aren't very good. Um, LMSR was great because it was the first one invented, but the share price jumps a ton. I have an Excel file where if you, if you basically set up the shares right, and you have 1,000 on one outcome and 1,000 on another, and you buy 10 shares of one outcome, it costs you 9.9999, and your expected value, even if you're right, is only 10. So that's the problem with LMSR. And so your best, your best option is pretty much LS LMSR or the Microsoft one, and they're almost equivalent. And is it like, the, like the LMSR, it doesn't have, at least as far as we know, compensating advantages. Like, well, here's a reason you'd want to use that. So. The LS LMSR is just better in every circumstance. That's the one we should use. All right, guys, thank you so much.